continuing to uh, work through our series this morning, Your New Normal Starts Now. And we're identifying some things that have uh, come to surface uh, in, during this, this pandemic, things uh, that we want to kind of put in motion um, before, uh, without having to wait until um, things get back to normal, whatever that may be. We want to learn from, so, from some of the things we've experienced and not have to wait, but we want to kind of put some of these things in motion now because our new normal starts now. This morning we're going to focus our attention on something that uh, is a very big frustration to every one of us. And, and actually this particular one, it certainly, um, it predates the coronavirus, the pandemic that we are dealing with right now. And um, I think it's one of those things we've always kind of struggled with at one time or another, but maybe it's a little bit more heightened right now. Uh, if you're not on guard, it's, it's something that tends to, to pull you away from the things that are most meaningful to you, the things that are most helpful to you, perhaps the things that are most rewarding to you. Today we're going to talk about distractions and how to not fall prey to distractions. Anybody ever have any distractions get introduced into their life, right? There's a whole wave of distractions. That's why I said it really predates the, the pandemic that we find ourselves in. But how do we not fall prey to the distractions of life? How do we remain focused on the things that God calls us to remain focused on? The title of my message this morning is Distractions, You Won't Detour Me. Distractions, you won't detour me. Last year, I was heading back. I had a meeting in Pennsylvania with some pastors, and I'm driving down 95, approaching uh, New York City, and um, just kind of got distracted. And as the road kind of went this way, I kind of went that way. And I found myself very late at night somewhere in New Jersey. And I thought to myself, this is a place that nobody should be. It's like midnight at this point. But you see, I was talking to a pastor on the phone, and my conversation was just getting very intense, and it was very distracted from where I was, what I was doing and where I was going, that I kind of found myself in the midst of a detour because I landed somewhere in Jersey where, honestly, nobody ought to be after dark. As I looked around, I thought to myself, I really shouldn't be here. And I looked at the people on the streets. They seemed to know I didn't belong uh, in that place. But I got pulled because of this distraction. It led to a detour. And you know what was true on the highway heading to New York City, I have discovered is true on the highway to life. When we allow ourselves to get distracted from our mission in life, it, it detours us from where God wants us to be and from what God calls us to be doing. A distraction, I'll define it like this, a distraction is a subtle invitation to detour you from God's plan for your life. A distraction is a subtle invitation. It's a subtle invitation to detour you from God's plan for your life. Now, in preparing for this, I thought there's a lot of different angles. I can tackle this idea of distractions. None, none of us are unaware of distractions that get introduced into our lives. We can kind of look at this and consider it from the, uh, from the angle of how we can allow detours to, um, or distractions to detour us from fulfilling God's mission for our life, right? God's created us on purpose and for a purpose, right? And we are here today as people on mission. There's something God's called each and every one of us to do. And there are times where we can allow if we're, not, if we're not careful, the distractions of life can detour us 
from what God has called us to do. And so that was certainly one angle we could look at. And then I thought also we can consider how, the, how distractions tend to detour us from our daily routine. I think that's something that we're all very familiar with, right? We're kind of heading in this direction. It's like, oh, there's donuts over here. And then like we start moving over here and then there's this over here and like squirrel, right? We could kind of, we just have, we're very easy and very prone to get distracted from the things that uh, pull us and, and, and pull us away from the things that we're doing. How many times have you like set in your head, this is where I'm going, this is what I'm gonna do, and then you get detoured, and then you forgot? Like, what was I supposed to be doing? Where was I going? And I, I don't know, I'm over 50 now, and so I'm, I'm just finding that happens a little bit more often. And maybe you don't even remember that happens to you. And that probably is another level of, of, of excitement. At least it doesn't bother you as much, right? And so I guess there's that part where you realize it happens. And then there's that part where you don't even care. You don't even notice it anymore. But, but we, tend to get, we tend to get distracted. And so in looking at this, I'm thinking, what angle do I want to come from? And then I, then I realized something that, that this is really just two sides of the, of the same coin. Our daily routine is how we go about fulfilling God's mission for us. They are not intended to be disconnected. They're not supposed to be running parallel from each other, but instead with each other's, with each other. Our, reflection, our lives are to reflect our mission. And so ultimately, what is our mission? Our mission, very simply, is this, is just to know him and to make him known. That's why you and I were left here. It's, a, it's really just, that's a summary of the Great Commission. Jesus calls us to go into all the world and make disciples, right? But you can't make disciples unless you are a disciple. And so we first, we encounter God, we grow in our faith, we walk with the master. And then and as we're pursuing him, we take anybody we can alongside us and we seek to make disciples. We seek to bring Jesus to the world around us, to influence the world like the salt of, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. And so we're called to do both of those things. And so on our mission in life as a disciple of Jesus, it's to actively pursue our relationship with Christ and, and then also to bring as many people alongside us as possible. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of distractions that come our way to keep us from those things. Between the world and the flesh and the devil, there's an intentional plan to distract you from what is God's best for you. I hope you realize that God's best for you is that you're walking close with Jesus. Because as you're walking close with Jesus, you're able to realize God's plan and purpose for your life. And there's a sense of fulfillment and that awareness that, that I'm walking in the, the design that God has for me. And really all of my needs that I used to kind of try and meet using so many different other methods, they're met in Christ alone. So we look at the turmoil around us and the the pandemic and the, the vaccines and the racial and political tensions and the anger and the hate and the frustration, there's all kinds of distractions. Then you start throwing in the, the, the TVs and your cell phones and your iPads and your iMacs and your iWhatevers. And there's, there's so many things that, that can pull us from what God is calling us to do. And you see, all of those things in and of themselves, none of those things are bad in and of themselves, but if they pull us from our ultimate purpose of growing in our walk with Christ, then they become a distraction and it detours us from God's best for our lives. And so a great question to ask yourself is, how much time is being spent in God's word, pursuing God, versus being informed by the news or social media? What am I allowing to influence? You see, here's the thing. The thing that will influence your thinking the most are the things that you allow to pour into you the most. You see, there's so much information being presented to us from so many different sources that it's easy to be distracted and avoid pursuing a biblical perspective. And you know what? As Christians, we are to have a biblical perspective, a biblical response to much of the chaos and much of the concerns of our day. There's an answer for how we are to live in such a time as this. 
But we need to be careful to not get distracted from God's plan. If we get distracted from God's plan, we're just going to respond the way everybody else does. I'm not saying we shouldn't be informed. I'm just being, I just want to say that we shouldn't be so pursuing information on the outside that we are not first seeking God's heart as the primary influence in our lives. We had to wrestle with that as a church. And, and obviously with this whole pandemic, and obviously we recognize the church is called to be together. We are called to gather together, to worship together. But then with some of the restrictions that were kind of put upon us, we're like, all right, we need to now, how do we accomplish what we are called to do? The, the mission is clear. The, the mandate is clear uh, from, from God's word. How do we join together and be in fellowship with one another while living in this current context. And so it caused us to kind of have to be as creative as possible. And you see, here's the thing. Chaos and, 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 and context and all the things that we're kind of dealing with the world in the world around us, that just becomes the new playground for where we carry out our mission. That's the that becomes the playground where we carry out our mission. God's mission hasn't changed. And so as, as God's people, we need to look at the opportunities that are before us. And instead of being distracted and knocked around like a ping pong ball all over the place, we need to look and say, no, how in the midst of this do I continue to grow in my walk with Christ? And how do I influence those people that God has entrusted in my, into my care? Maybe you're here and you say, but you know what? I have just been distracted. Maybe you've been, maybe you've just kind of been knocked off course. Maybe, maybe you've been distracted by discouragement. Maybe, maybe it's disappointment. Maybe people have let you down. Maybe the fear of all that's going on. And, uh, and instead of allowing those things to be uh, a resource to pull you closer to God, maybe you just got distracted and detoured and it caused you to get a little further away from God. I don't know your story, but I know that every one of us at one time or another finds ourselves realizing that we are prone to wander. And the ways in which we tend to wander sometimes is we get our eyes off of Jesus and on the storm, on the stuff around us, and then we find ourselves getting detoured. Well, if that's, you, if that's you today, I've got some really good news for you. The end of the story hasn't taken place. There's pages still being written in your book and your new normal, it starts right now. And so starting now, I'm going to put distractions, the distractions of life on notice and say distractions, you won't detour me. Distractions, you won't Detour me. God has a plan for me. God invites me into relationship with him. I have found truth and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to make sure that I remain on mission and I'm going to share it with everyone and anyone who will listen. Distractions, you will not detour me. It is a fixed point that we must come to where we recognize that anything that pulls us away from Jesus is a distraction and it must be put in its proper place and a boundary around it must be put in motion so that it doesn't continue to distract us. We're going to take a look at an event that took place in the life of Nehemiah this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. And I think that there's some interesting things that we can see uh, that takes place in the life and ministry of Nehemiah that we might be able to draw some insight from as we look to see how do we uh, pr protect ourselves from falling prey to distractions. Here, here, here's, the, here's the backdrop. Here's the, here's the context. The, it's, it's about 500 BC at this point. Jerusalem has been devastated. Her walls are knocked down. Her gates are burned to the ground. The people are discouraged. They're desperate. And they are weary. And the destroyed city of Jerusalem that they loved so much served as a constant reminder of their disobedience 
and of their failure because their disobedience to God is what brought upon the judgment of God. And the people of God at this point were a shadow of what they once were. In walks Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a Jew. He lives about a thousand miles away. However, he has a love for the people of God. He has a love for Jerusalem. And upon hearing the news of his country and his people, he immediately goes into a time of prayer and fasting. And he is reminded that the same God who brought this rebellious people to dust 150 years earlier still had his mighty hand upon them. And if they would just turn back to God, they would realize that they are people with a destiny. Nehemiah served in the king's chamber. He was a cupbearer. It was a very high position. It was somebody that the king made himself very vulnerable to and not many people at all would ever hold that place. And so when the king found a cup bearer that he can trust and was loyal, he was not willing to let go of that person. But Nehemiah does the unthinkable. He goes to the king and he asks permission. Can I go to Jerusalem and begin to rebuild the city of Jerusalem? And uncommon to that day, he is, he is granted permission and he heads to this place that lay in ruins. And he begins to gather a people. A people who are discouraged, a people who are defeated, a people who are distracted and, and detoured from their identity as the people of God. They're distracted and detoured from their mission. And Nehemiah rallies this group of people together and they begin to reconstruct the walls of the city that lie in ruin. It's an amazing story as you read through the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah presents the narrative to us of a people who were once divided, but then they came together with a shared mission, a, a united focus. But it was not without distractions. It was not without opportunity to stop the work. It wasn't without distractions from within, and it was not without distractions from the outside as well. And I want to present to you just one snapshot of a time where Nehemiah needed to say no to all of the distractions so that he can say yes to what God had called him to do. And I think that if we, if we look at this text, we might be able to see in his response how you and I can say no to distractions so that we would not fall prey to the distractions of life that keep us from God's best. As they begin making progress, momentum was building. Things were starting to look good. Their chins were starting to raise. Their shoulders were starting to get squared. They started to realize that, you know what? This just might be possible. They started to get very enthusiastic and people were working day and night and working on this wall together, depending upon one another, depending upon God. And it started to start coming to fruition right before their very eyes. And this discouraged group of people was finding great encouragement that this work was beginning to get done. And then the enemies began to take note that this defeated people weren't living so defeated anymore. This place that lie in ruins was starting to breathe once again. And they sought to distract Nehemiah and detour him from this project that God had called him to. Can I just say for a moment that the moment you cross the line and you say, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to stop walking in the flow of the world and turn my back on that and walk with Jesus, there are going to be distractions that come your way. If you're living as a Christian and you're not coming up against opposition, a great thing to can wonder is, am I walking with the world or am I walking against it? 
Because as we, at the moment we say, you know what, I, I, I'm going to, I'm no longer going to live for myself. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to let the life of Christ be lived out in me. You become a threat to the kingdom of hell, and he's going to do anything he possibly can to distract you and detour you from that mission. And so if distractions come your way and disappointment even comes your way, I hope you find great hope this morning because here's the thing, you then become a threat to the kingdom of hell. The moment that you say no more, I'm not living for me, I'm living for God, all hell will break loose and he'll throw distractions your way. And we need to learn how do we Identify and not fall prey to those distractions. And so the work is getting done, right? People are, are seeing, that you know, people are taking notice and the enemy is trying to detour them from their mission. And what we will see here again is how ne Nehemiah pushes back from these distractions that were sent to him to knock him off of his mission. Let's take a look at some of these distractions and see how my, maybe we can identify some distractions our own in our own life, and how do we avoid a detour? Nehemiah chapter six and verse one says, "Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up until that time I had not finished the doors in the gate, very thorough, right." Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together at Hecaphirim. Everybody say Hecaphirim. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but we're going to call it that for today, right? <laughs> come and let us meet together at Hecaphirim in the plain of Ono. But, Nehemiah says, they intended to do me harm. I love this. Here he is. He is on the plain of Ono. Have you ever been there? You realize, you know, I'm, I'm in the midst of, oh no, what in the world is going on? That's what Nehemiah recognized right from the beginning. How do we avoid from being distracted? Number one, you be aware that you are a target. Be aware that you are a target. Look what Nehemiah says here. They intended to do me Harm. Nehemiah knew their intentions towards him were not good. And what he did is he maintained a ready position because he had their number. Those of you who played baseball, you remember your coach always tell you, take the ready position, right? Just be ready for whatever might come your way. And, 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 and that, that's exactly what we see he, here, this idea of be aware that you're a target, Nehemiah knew that the intentions of these people were not for his good. Likewise, raise your awareness to the fact that things are going to be introduced into your life on a regular basis with the intention of detouring you from your mission, from growing in your walk with Christ and being on mission. Peter says it this way. Peter says, be sober. Be vigilant, know that the enemy prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Be on the alert. Be aware that you're a target. So here's the question. Do I begin my day aware and alert that there are forces out there that seek to detour me by distraction? Do I begin my day aware and alert that there are forces out there that seek to detour me by distraction? I want to encourage you to start your day with a reminder, some kind of a, whether it's a sticky note or a Bible verse, verse or maybe Alexa reminds you of something in the morning or Siri or, or whoever, something that reminds you to be alert. Like a soldier about to enter into our war zone, we need to recognize as we begin our day, something's gonna come our way to distract me from what God ultimately calls me to do. The enemy wants to fill every minute of your 24 hour day with everything other than God. And we must be on the alert, be on your ready position. Once you set your mind, you know what, listen, at 11 o'clock every day, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read my Bible every day at 11 o'clock. You know what's going to happen. 10.55, everybody's going to call you. Everybody, somebody needs prayer. Somebody, all good things. Somebody needs this. Somebody needs that. 
every distraction, be on the alert. Look what happens in verse three. And I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? I love that. Look, I love Nehemiah's response here. I'm doing a great work for God. Why in the world would I stop to come down and visit with you? The second thing that we need to recognize if we want to avoid falling prey to distraction is this. Know the value of your mission. Know the value of your mission. Nehemiah put everything into perspective when he said, hey, listen, I'm doing a great work for God. And unless you've got something better than that, more important than that, I don't have time to stop what God is calling me to do. I can't leave it. You see, he recognized the sacredness of his task. He was doing a great work for God. And likewise, you and I are we're on a sacred mission, a divine invitation to engage in a, a deeper, more intimate walk with our creator. And anything that tries to rob me of that needs to be seen as a distraction, maybe even the enemy. The awesome opportunity that is presented to us to walk with Jesus must never become something that we can take or leave. It can never become something that we become familiar with. Hey, am I going to spend time with God or not? It shouldn't be something that we can negotiate so easily. Know the value of your mission. Know that the creator of the universe invites you to know him so deeply that his reflection is stamped on you for all the world to see. You're, God invites you to get so close to him that his reflection is stamped on you for all the world to see. It's not a call to religion. I love that song we sang this morning that Emily led us in. It's not a call to religion. It's not a call to, to traditions, but a depth of life-changing relationship that brings purpose and fulfillment the way God has designed us to walk in. And so here's a great question to, for you to consider in your quiet time. Do I allow the cares of the world to eclipse the awesome privilege of knowing God deeply? Do I allow, because nothing forces it, right? Do I allow the cares of the world to eclipse the privilege of knowing God deeply? Look how he responds to, to this in, in verse four. It says, they sent to me four times this way. Not once, not twice, not three times, four times. They came to me four times and I answered them in the same manner. One of, a, one of the best ways to avoid being distracted and detoured is, is the importance of consistency in your walk with Christ. Nehemiah, Nehemiah didn't waffle back and forth in a dialogue with them. He didn't change his tune. He, he maintained a consistent, diligent, unbending posture and responded the same way every single time. There was no maybe in his no. It was a firm no. Once, twice, three, four times, Nehemiah said, I responded the same every single time. It's a call to consistency. And likewise, the key to discipleship, the key to growing in our walk with Christ is a long obedience in the same direction. A consistent, unbending pursuit that will not negotiate, it will not compromise or meander through the maze of mediocrity. It is a firm commitment to pursuing Jesus. Now listen, discipleship is not about perfection. It's about our direction. It doesn't mean you're not going to have setbacks along the way. It's not going to mean that you're not going to fail here or there. John says it this way. I love this in his epistle. He says, my children, I write these things that you might not sin. But if any one of you do sin, 
You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In other words, listen, God knows our frame. He knows we're going to blow it. And what we need to do at that point, when we drop the ball, we need to pick it up, we need to brush ourselves off, and we need to fall in the face of Jesus again, at the feet of Jesus again. Christianity is not about religion. It is not about perfection. It is about a relationship. It is the pursuit of the lover of our souls. And sometimes we hit the mark and sometimes we just don't. And when we don't, don't live in discouragement. Don't beat yourself up. Brush yourself off and come to Jesus. It's about consistency. Here's a great question to consider. What can I do to develop a healthy rhythm of spiritual growth? What can I do to develop a healthy rhythm of spiritual growth? You know, every one of us in our day, everybody's different, but everybody has something that they do usually the same time every day. Whether it's your cup of coffee, whether it's a show that you walk, whether, whether it's the time you go to the bathroom, whatever it may be, right? We have rhythms in our life, and, and maybe we need to look and see, how can I incorporate a rhythm into my life that continues to cause me to grow in my walk with Christ? What can I do to develop a healthy rhythm of spiritual growth? Look what happens in verse 5. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, here we go, now we've moved from four to five times, for the fifth time, he sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand, I love this, and he says, and it was written... It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you're building the wall, and according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you've also even set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem that this is the king, that there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports, and so now come and let us take counsel together. After four times, they realize they're not going to be able to get, they're not going to be able to distract Nehemiah. And so he does what everybody else does. Hey, listen, everybody is talking. Everybody, listen, Nehemiah, I've got your best interest in mind. And, and I, don't, I don't believe this, but, but people are saying things. Don't you love that? Don't, don't, see, people do that a lot of times. They'll say, they'll say you know, hey, listen, um, everybody is concerned about this. And I love to press buttons and say, well, who specifically is saying that? I, I, well, I, uh, and you know, usually it boils down to one or two people that are critical about everything. But it sounds a lot more powerful when you say everybody feels this way. And that's exactly what we see taking place here. And they're like, listen, you know what? We, try, we're, we are 0 for 4 in trying to distract him. So let's, maybe we can scare him a little bit. Hey, listen, everybody's talking. Even Geshem believes it. And so... Nehemiah, listen, just for, for your own good, just, just put the progress on hold because people are talking. I had people tell me that when I, when, I, when, I, when I finally crossed over the line at 19 years old, I went full out for Christ and just literally left everything that I was doing. And I'll tell you what, for a couple of years, I had people say, all right, listen, I, I get you're into this whole God thing, but enough is enough. You're taking this too far. Everybody's talking. And I'll be like, well, let them talk. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so that's, that's what we see taking place here. They're like, listen, just, just stop doing what you're doing because everybody's speaking. How do, we, how do we avoid from being detoured? Number four, sometimes you have to turn your back on the crowd. Sometimes you have to turn your back on the crowd, on what they say. I like what Maxwell Cato says. He says, if, if a man wants to lead an orchestra, he has to turn his back on the crowd. All right? You know, we're currently living in a time where the walk of faith goes against the mainstream thinking of our day. You can no longer seek after the affirmation of popular opinion to support your biblical convictions. The world has, has Christianity in its sights because the teachings of Christ and the call of Christianity goes against the, the wisdom of this world, and I use that word very, very loosely. And we, we need to be willing to turn our back 
on the crowd so that we can set our eyes solely fixed on Jesus Christ. Question, how important is it to fit in with the world around you? How important is it, really? Now here at church, we all say, oh, it's not that important. In your quiet time, Consider your ways, your actions, your decisions, your priorities, the things you put first and second, and then answer that question with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. How important is it to fit in with the world around me? Look at Nehemiah's response in verse eight. He said, after the fifth try, I sent to them saying, no such things as you say have been done. You're inventing them out of your own mind. There is no credibility. There's nothing to validate what you're saying. You are just creating this out of your own mind. I love what he does here. He doesn't go, oh, everybody's talking. Oh no, what am I going to do? Everybody, no, nobody's going to like me now. Oh, let me stop what I'm doing. Let me tell them, show them I, I still fit in with everybody. I can still relate with everybody. He doesn't do that. He says, no, what you're saying doesn't make sense. Ultimately, what he's doing is number five, he's letting truth guide him. Number five is let truth guide you? How do you avoid from being distracted and detoured? Let truth guide you. He doesn't allow the lies, the distractions, or the voices of others to guide him. He held on to what he knew to be true. I know why I'm here. I know my motives. I know what God has called me to do. I know that this is not about me. This is about the mission that God has called me to do. It's about God. And so he continued to build the wall. And likewise, we can't allow the distractions around us to cause us to question what we know to be true. That God loves you. That God has a plan for your life. That God's word is true all the time. That God invites me into a deeper walk with him. And it was so important to God that I would enjoy that relationship that he sent his only son so that I can have relationship with God, with God. And that my relationship with God is going to exceed my time on this earth. What does a prophet a man if he gains the whole world, Jesus said, and loses his soul? Question, do I spend more time getting distracted by the lies around me? Or embracing truth? Let truth guide you. Verse 9, for they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work. Surely this will do it. We're going to scare them to death. Their hands will stop, will drop from the work, and it will not be done. And Nehemiah says, but now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. I like that. You see, Nehemiah knew that if, it was, if he was operating in his own strength and his own ability, that very well might have been the outcome. And he says, they, they're doing this to frighten us, and he kind of is a little bit, and so he says, oh God, strengthen my hands. You see, Nehemiah wasn't depending on the affirmation of others, nor was Nehemiah depending on his own strength or the strength of the people, but he recognized that his strength to accomplish what God had called them to do was directly connected to the fact that God would complete the work in them. And the sixth thing that we see here is that God will help you. That God will help you. You see, sometimes we can look at the call of Christ for us who are his disciples and we can think there's no way I could possibly do it. And if you've said that, then you have accepted the most important part of truth. You can't do it. That's why Christ came. You see, if you can fulfill all that God required on your own strength, Jesus would have never had to come. He would have just said, do it. But he knew we didn't have the tools. We didn't have the ability to do that. And so Christ came. And God helps us. 
In fact, fast forward the, you fast forward a little further into the, uh, into the, the narrative of what take pla- took place in Nehemiah. They recognized that God, as they completed the, uh, the, the building, right? They, 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 at this point, they knew that God was going to complete the, build, the, the work for them, through them. And look what ended up being said now from these people who had something to say earlier. In verse 15, it says, So the wall was finished on the 12th day of the month Elul in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of God. They recognize that there's no way that this group of people could possibly accomplish what they accomplished. And so all of the naysayers, all of the enemies looked back and said, surely God was in their midst. And they became greatly frightened because they realized they weren't going just against the people of God. They were going against God himself. And likewise, we need to remember that while we're pushing back against the distractions that seek to to detour us, that the outcome is not all on us. Paul reminds us that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus knows your frame. He knows your frame. And he's going to complete the work. That's what Paul said to the church of Philippi. I'm confident to this very thing that he who began a good work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And so our responsibility is to do everything we possibly could to pursue Jesus, to know him and make him known. But we fully realize that our own efforts will fall short. But when we have exhausted our own strength and we've realized and we've used what God has given us to use, God the Holy Spirit will come alongside us and help us to accomplish what our own efforts can never do themselves. God will help you. And so simply accept the invitation to enjoy a deeper walk with the Savior and to move forward in the knowledge that even if nobody else runs alongside you, God will help you and you'll find your place in God's story. And so distractions, I know you're present. My guard is up. I am on the alert. I know the value of my mission. It is sacred. I am pursuing Jesus consistently. I am turning my back on the ground, uh, 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 on the crowd, and I embra- am embracing the truth that will guide me and the God who will help me. Therefore, distractions, you won't detour me. And my new normal starts right now. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you never call us to something that you don't give us the ability to accomplish. Just the very nature of grace is that you give us what we need to be what you call us to be. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here that has been feeling distracted and has seen that that they have just been even detoured, whether they're here in the sanctuary or watching online or on TV, Lord, I just, I pray, God, that you would remind them that You are a God of help. You come alongside. You meet our greatest needs in the person of yourself. And so we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that we'd find great encouragement in your love for us. We thank you that today is a new day, that our new normal starts right now. Amen.